The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Minds. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Coming up on the show, media around the world have been hyping up the Mars One project, which aims to send people on a one-way trip to Mars starting year 2024. I'll speak with renowned U.S. science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson about what Mars provokes in the popular imagination. But first, a look at how media reports on Latin America. Uruguay's former president, Pepe Mujica, has slammed the effects that U.S. prison torture center Guantanamo Bay has on its detainees. Mujica was referring specifically to the six former Guantanamo prisoners who arrived in Uruguay last December to live. Prior to receiving the prisoners, the New York Times last September suggested that Mujica would backtrack on his promise to accept them for political reasons. A spokesperson for Mujica denied the accusation. And now, months later, the former inmates are living free in Uruguay. Mujica decried the torture that the unjustly accused prisoners in Guantanamo Bay had been exposed to. He described them as having turned halfway into vegetables during their detention. These people are destroyed, he said. Mujica's comments beg the question. Will the New York Times now report on Uruguay's efforts to rehabilitate the prisoners from the effects of Guantanamo Bay? Global media has been buzzing about the Mars One project. The project aims to establish a permanent human settlement on Mars by sending crews of four on a one-way trip every two years, beginning year 2024. Kim Stanley Robinson is a highly acclaimed and award-winning U.S. science fiction writer. Among many other science fiction books, he is author of The Mars Trilogy, an award-winning series of science fiction novels. He joins me to discuss what Mars can provoke in the popular imagination. Hi, Stan. Welcome to Imaginary Lines. Thanks, Chris. It's good to be on. Why is Mars so interesting to our popular imagination? I think it's because we can really see it in the night sky and we know it's there for sure. And then from our scientific studies, we know that it's a real place, uh, an entire planet. It has a land surface that's equal to Earth's land surface and it has water, although it's frozen, and it's empty. So it just represents a kind of blank slate of possibility where we could imagine starting a, a new a fresh start and maybe get it right this time. It's essentially, it's a, a blank imaginary space. Aside from the excitement of exploring other worlds, there also seems to be an aspect of wanting to escape the alienation embedded in our own social order here on Earth. What can the drive to colonize Mars tell us about the problems on Earth? Well, there's a bad and a good to this, in my opinion. The bad is that the escapism involved it, it, it comes from several different kinds of category errors. Going there would actually be more alienating than being in almost any situation on Earth except in prison. Uh, the analogy that you could use is to think of Mars as going to Antarctica. And anybody that's been to Antarctica realizes that going outdoors is a big problem. It's like being stuck in a bunch of little motels. It's not as exciting as you might imagine, even though there are moments of great beauty. But the good part of it is this. People are thinking, we need a different way. We need difference. And what you, Mars functions then as is a kind of modeling space. It's, a, it's an empty enough that you could imagine going there and doing things differently. And then what you would hope to have happen next is that you transfer that imaginative utopian modeling to the situation on Earth and say, well, what in that is good that we could actually do here, starting in the history that we're stuck in? There's a long history of utopian science fiction, Edward Bellamy's late 19th century looking backward being one example. 
What role has utopian science fiction played in shaping our history and current society? Well, I really like it that you mentioned Bellamy because he's not well remembered. But in the late 19th century, his book, Looking Backwards, was uh, a, a phenomenal success. And there became Bellamy clubs all over the United States. And the progressive political movement that made a lot of improvements in uh, U.S. politics in the 1890s through the Teddy Roosevelt era, they all came out of Bellamy's books as in terms of the ideas that they were trying to enact to increase democracy, to increase equality. These were uh, utopian ideas out of, out of Bellamy, and so that was a big impact. Uh, another big impact is H.G. Wells, because he wrote at least five, maybe five to ten utopian novels. They aren't his most famous books, but from, say, 1905 with A Modern Utopia up to his death in 1945, uh, he kept writing utopian fictions, and at the end of World War II, when they had to reconstruct the international world order, it was truly H.G. Wells' utopian novels that these um, British and uh, uh, Anglo um, uh, bureaucrats used as models. To, well, how can we put together an international... Um, it was basically a technocracy. I mean, it sort of led to globalization and the neoliberal state, so there are obviously some severe problems with it. But what I'm saying is that Wells's books, his utopian uh, novels, had a big impact on world history. Is the exercise of imagining how things could be different on another planet or our own an inherently political act? And if so, why? Well, I think it is an inherently political act because um, our socioeconomic system is legalistic. We actually have the rule of law. This is a technology, really, a, a, like a software system that runs the planet for us. It's as an amazing accomplishment that seven billion human beings can live on this planet and uh, not end up killing themselves and going into an instant crash state. And that's because of the rule of law. So we change laws all the time and uh, that's by a political process most of the time. When violence becomes involved it's a disaster but if it is uh, if it's a legal political means where we change the laws then it's just normal politics. And so when you propose a new system, you're saying, let's make some political changes. Just recently, Thomas Piketty, the French economist, wrote Capitalism in the 21st Century. He proposed at the end that we not only have a progressive tax on income, but that we have a progressive taxation on capital assets, which is much more revolutionary thought, because you can hide your income. When you're rich enough in the neoliberal system, you can say, well, I didn't make any money last year because you plowed it back into your company. But you can't hide capital assets. So if there was a global a progressive tax where the more you owned in capital assets, the more you had to give back to the public good, you could quickly uh, uh, do a kind of horizontalization of, of wealth, of prosperity, of power, and of um, uh, political power is what I mean. And that would be good for everybody. As a science fiction writer who has written extensively about Mars, what kind of structural changes would you implement on the planet? Well, I did this in my Mars novels, and I guess uh, it's a matter of me remembering what I uh, suggested there, but a lot of it came from uh, uh, stepwise from the situation that already exists so that uh, capitalism would be pushed to the margins and in the middle would be something that could be better described as socialism but uh, working through worker cooperatives and where workers hire their own management rather than management hiring labor uh, treatment of human beings as the ultimate point of the economic system rather than uh, them being uh, turned into a commodity of labor so it was a matter of co-ops working on the, th the necessities of life and making sure that Food, water, shelter, clothing, education, and health care were all, uh, in effect, public utility districts. That they were uh, something that everybody did for each other as a non-profit, as, as essentially part of uh, government, but government of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you very much, Stan, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. My pleasure, Chris, and say hi to, uh, well, hi to everybody in your audience. It's a pleasure to speak to you. The controversial Iranian opposition group, National Council of Resistance of Iran, has released a new report alleging a new Iranian nuclear weapons site. Despite serious questions about the report's authenticity, major media such as Fox News and the Washington Post have legitimized it.
The report claims that this new nuclear program is deep underground in a sealed bunker outside Tehran. But bloggers and others have noted inconsistencies, such as the group's photo that purports to be vault doors used to prevent radiation leaks. An uncropped version of the same photo shows that the image is actually a product shot from a company that sells explosion-resistant doors. David Albright, a nuclear expert and president of the Institute for Science and International Security, told USA Today that the group's claims are so controversial that any manipulated evidence cast doubt on the whole story. That's it for today's Imaginary Lines. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Chris Spanos. Please join me next week.